Greetings, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mark McEnroy, and I am pleased to embark today on a session titled Breaking Beauty, Icons and Iconoclasm. This is the second installment in our four-part series, The Beauty of God, a short course in theological aesthetics. Last time, we saw that ancient Christian theologians regarded God as beautiful. This time, we will explore some of the implications of that idea as it affects the practice of Christianity. The idea that God is beautiful, and in particular, that the beauty of the world reflects the beauty of the Creator, shapes what Christianity looks like, the way in which Christian devotion to God manifests. One of the ways this commitment to aesthetics plays out involves the use of images in Christian worship. For centuries in the early church, Christians used icons in liturgy, especially in the Christian East, in what we call the Byzantine Empire. However, in the 8th and 9th centuries, this practice became highly controversial, and iconoclasts, or image breakers, argued that images should not be used in devotion to God. The question of the day became, are images of God false idols? Today, we will examine the reasons that iconoclasts thought as they did, the motivations behind their destruction of images. And we will also see that image breaking in the early church pushed Christian theologians such as John of Damascus and Theodore the Studite to articulate sophisticated theological rationales supporting the use of images. These figures, known as iconoduels or iconophiles, proved to be persuasive in the Christian East, resulting in a robust use of images down to the present day in Eastern Orthodox Christianity. However, as we will see in our final portion of today's session, the West received their ideas differently, resulting in a mixed legacy concerning the use of images in Western Christianity. So as we begin, we turn to the year 726. In that year, Emperor Leo issued a decree against icons, and he removed the image of Christ that had been over a prominent palace gate in Constantinople. Here is a reconstruction. This image was, in the words of one scholar, quote, the most representative religious portrayal in the empire. Its removal was designed to make a statement. In fact, in place of the image, Leo III fixed a cross, a counter image of sorts, and he added the following inscription. The Lord God does not allow the fashioning of an image of Christ that is lifeless and without breath, made of earthly matter despised by the sacred writings. Now, if we were to ask what is motivating the emperor, we see two clues here. First, there is a reference to the second commandment, which reads, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. The prohibition against images then comes straight from scripture, which clearly states that they should not be made. However, for all the worry about images in scripture, I would submit that this inscription goes further than what we find there. Here we read about earthly matter being despised. That idea actually stands at odds with significant portions of scripture. In particular, the creation story in Genesis 1, in which we see that the creation is good. So what's going on here? Why speak of matter being despised? I would suggest that another influence is in play. It comes not from Judaism or Christianity, but rather from Greek philosophy, which had an enormous influence on Christianity in its early days. In particular, Leo III's attitude toward matter closely echoes the attitude held within Platonism, or the views following the Greek philosopher Plato. Platonism tends to view reality as fundamentally divided. It is a dualist way of thinking. There is the material realm, the world of matter, but there is also an immaterial realm. It might be helpful to use the word spiritual to describe it. And not only is the world divided in this way, but different values are attached to each aspect of reality. 
the immaterial realm is valued positively. It is good. The material realm is valued ne negatively. It is bad, even evil. Christianity engages in intricate ways with this highly influential philosophical view. And at this stage in the history of the church, the Platonic view of matter exerts a powerful influence. So when Leo maintains that the sacred writings despise earthly matter, I would suggest that it is not in fact so much scripture as Platonic philosophy that guides him. And this is important because the sweeping suspicion toward matter we see here can be argued to be not in fact properly Christian, but instead the result of outside influences on Christianity. So if this is the first aspect of the iconoclast position, let's look now at the response articulated by John of Damascus. As his name suggests, John is from Damascus, which at this point in time is not under Byzantine rule. His location outside the Byzantine Empire and its iconoclastic emperor frees John to advance a position that robustly defends the use of icons. And indeed, his views become enshrined in Christian reflection on this issue. A key portion of his defense goes as follows. In olden days, God, who was without body or physical form, was not depicted at all. But now, since God has appeared in the flesh and has interacted with man, I am able to depict the visible aspect of God. Here we see acknowledgement that, at one point in time, God was not portrayed in images. During that time, the second commandment was entirely appropriate. However, things have changed. Why? because God has appeared in the flesh. In other words, in the incarnation, God made an image of God's self. Christians then, in making images of God, only continue what God has started. Image making, therefore, receives its authorization from none other than God. Now, John of Damascus is not simply saying that God has done this so we can do it too. He goes on to describe how matter should be regarded after the Incarnation. I do not worship matter. I only worship the creator of matter, him who, for my sake, became matter himself, and took it upon himself to dwell in matter, and who by means of matter brought about my salvation. And I shall never cease to honor that matter through which my salvation was accomplished, but of course, I do not honor it as if it were God. Matter has been used by God to do some extraordinary things. And, God, and John's argument is that the capacities of matter itself have therefore been changed. God has dwelt in matter, and through matter, God has brought about our salvation. Now, at one level, this claim is obvious. In the Incarnation, God took flesh. And yet, its implications are arguably not fully seen until the iconoclastic controversies of the 8th and 9th centuries. By residing within matter, by uniting with matter, God has given matter the ability to carry God. This is as far from a platonic view of the world as one can imagine. Matter is certainly not evil, it's not even an impediment to God. Instead, matter is the very vehicle through which God has made God's self known. As our author puts it elsewhere, I honor material things not as though they were God, but inasmuch as they are replete with divine energy and grace. The error of the iconoclasts is not only that they don't take seriously enough the idea of God as preeminent image maker, they also drastically underestimate matter. They do not account for the way in which the divine energy and grace can permeate matter and therefore allow it to convey divinity. As our final remark on John of Damascus, we note the distinction that he draws between worship and honor. As he clearly states, only God should be worshiped. Matter can and should be honored, but our attitude to it 
should not rise to the level of worship. This distinction later becomes enshrined in the year 787 at the Second Council of Nicaea, which endorses the use of icons with this key qualification. The relevant text reads as follows. One should pay these images the tribute of salutation and respectful veneration. Certainly, this is not the full adoration in accordance with our faith, which is properly paid only to the divine nature. Only God receives full adoration or worship. Images receive veneration or honor, but they are not worshipped as God is worshipped. Nicaea too, then, represents the official teaching of the Church on the question of images. But there is another criticism of the use of images and another response to that criticism, both of which go significantly deeper than we have gone thus far. The criticism is launched by Leo III's successor, Constantine V, and the response is offered by a figure named Theodore the Studite. Let's look at Constantine's argument for prohibiting images of God. To understand what he's up to, we need to talk about some language that he employs. The two terms are key, circumscribed and uncircumscribed. For something to be circumscribed means that it can be encompassed. Literally, one can draw or write, scribe around it. It can be contained. For something to be uncircumscribed, by contrast, means that it cannot be drawn around. It cannot be contained. Whereas humanity can be circumscribed, divinity cannot. God is uncircumscribable, Constantine V wants to say. With that in mind, let's look at the key component of his position. He explains, he who circumscribes this prosopon, that is, the face of Christ, has also circumscribed the divine nature, which indeed cannot be circumscribed. To Constantine, the error of the iconophiles is that they depict only part of Christ, not the whole Christ. They depict only that which can be circumscribed, namely his human nature. The divine nature cannot be circumscribed. It cannot be depicted or to use terms that might be more helpful and that we used last week, whereas humanity is visible, divinity is not. And as we saw with Origen last week, some in the early church held that even the image that God made of God's self was an invisible image. We heard from Origen that the Son is the invisible image of the Father. What this means, according to Constantine, is that images divide Christ. They portray only part of Christ, as only Christ's human nature can be depicted. Christ's divinity, according to Constantine, remains categorically hidden from view. In no way can it be seen nor depicted. Icons, then, are, at best, incomplete. They can portray only part of Christ. In fact, though, it's even worse to Constantine. Following the logic just outlined, he levels a derisive term on iconophiles. They are Nestorian. That is, just as a 5th century figure named Nestorius had been accused of doing, iconophiles do not allow Christ to be one person. Because only the humanity can be visually represented, they divide Christ splitting his humanity off from his divinity. Now, pursuing this issue with sufficient depth would take us too far afield for this session, but suffice it to say, to call someone a Nestorian in the Byzantine Empire was a highly charged accusation, and it gave iconoclasts a considerably more sophisticated argument than simply invoking the second commandment. One does not divide Christ and it would seem that this is precisely what images do. After Constantine V, then, things do not look good for iconophiles, and into the fray provoked by this refined iconoclasm jumps Theodore the Studite. In one of his writings opposing iconoclasm, he begins with the following. 
If merely mental contemplation were sufficient, it would have been sufficient for him to come to us in a merely mental way. In Jesus Christ, God did not come to us in only a mental way. And what that means is that mental contemplation alone is not sufficient. Theodore is saying that we should come to know God precisely in the way God has made God's self known. That way is not through a set of ideas. It's not merely mental. Instead, God has made God's self known to the senses in Jesus Christ. The implications of this claim are far-reaching. In seeking to understand God, to know God, we do not simply think about God as much as we can. And this is a good check on the tendencies of uh, some theologians, among others. Mental contemplation is not sufficient. God has displayed God's self to the world, and that must be taken seriously. The path forward on the question of images must begin here. Knowing God cannot be reduced to a set of mental exercises. It is inextricably connected to the senses and the material world. With this as his starting point, then, that God has made God's self known to the senses through the Incarnation, Theodore directly confronts a shortcoming in Constantine's view. I will cue up a passage in a moment that stands out as our most challenging for the day. So as a bit of orientation, we do well to say that, as far as Theodore is concerned, Constantine's error is that he underestimates the unifying power of Christ's person, the hypostatic union. In other words, Constantine does not take seriously enough that Christ's divine nature, which would ordinarily be invisible and uncircumscribable, has been joined to Christ's humanity in the one person of Christ. Let's see what that means. Theodore explains, One of the Trinity has entered human nature and become like us. There is a mixture of the immiscible, a compound of the uncombinable, that is, of the uncircumscribable with the circumscribed, of the boundless with the bounded, of the limitless with the limited, of the formless with the well-formed, which is indeed paradoxical. For this reason, Christ is depicted in images, and the invisible is seen. He who in his own divinity is uncircumscribable accepts the circumscription natural to his body. In other words, in the Incarnation, Christ has allowed his invisible divinity to become visible in his person, which unites divinity and humanity in one single being. Christ's divinity is not divinity as usual, so to speak, but instead divinity joined to humanity. Christ is one person, and his whole person is seen. It's a complex point, to be sure, But we can perhaps simplify it by noting that the disciples did not see only part of Christ. They did not see only Christ's human nature. Instead, they saw the whole Christ. His divine nature shone through as well. Another way to put it is to say that even the human flesh of Christ has been deified, permeated by the divine in the Incarnation. There is no mere humanity, no humanity without divinity to represent in images. Images, therefore, depict not only Christ's humanity, but also his divinity, which has, under the conditions of the Incarnation, allowed itself to be displayed, to be seen. That is why images do not, in fact, divide Christ, but instead depict him in his totality, his unity. In fact, Theodore even goes so far as to say that the Incarnation demands images. It is not simply that images are permissible. They are actually required. To deny images of Christ is nothing less than to deny the Incarnation, God's becoming an image for us. 
This leads us into an interesting point with which to close our treatment of the Christian East before we turn to a brief discussion of the West. In spite of the robust defenses of image use found among the figures we have examined, the danger of images is often mentioned, especially in the West. One is often told to be vigilant, lest one inadvertently cross the line between veneration and worship, drawn by John of Damascus in Nicaea II. Images are valuable, even necessary, but they are dangerous. They have an ever-present potential to mislead us into thinking too highly of them. If that is a well-established worry, what Theodore gives us are reasons to be concerned about the opposite danger, not of thinking too much of images, but too little, the danger of eliminating images entirely. Such a move would not only deprive Christian devotion of a richness well-suited to the glorious God toward whom it is directed, such a move would ultimately deny God the very means by which God asks to be known. It would not follow after what God has revealed, but instead take matters into our own hands. There are indeed reasons to be concerned about such a move. Having described in some detail the arguments concerning icons in the Christian East, let us now briefly treat the reception of those ideas in the West. Of greatest interest is a document commissioned by Charlemagne in the late 8th century called the Libri Carolini, the Books of Charles. The author of the document declares that it belongs to the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church to fix the faith and it is advanced as a reaction against the Second Council of Nicaea in particular. The key portion insists that Eastern figures have babbled that the service of adoration, which is due to the consubstantial and life-giving trinity, should be given images. What sane man ever said, ever either said or thought of saying such an absurdity as that different pictures should be held in the same honor as the holy, victorious trinity? Now, we immediately notice that a key distinction in the East is lost on the West, namely the distinction between adoration and veneration, between full worship and the more restrained honor. In other words, the Libri Carolini misunderstand the East as advocating worship of images, as recommending that pictures be held at the same level as the Trinity itself. Without the option of veneration, then, the Libri Carolini present a much reduced understanding of the place of images. As it is put, we allow pictures in the basilicas not for adoration, but for the commemoration of events and for the beauty of the walls. Images should be used as ornaments and memorials, but no more. Only God should be adored and worshipped. Although these books did not have much influence at the time of their writing, they were picked up with great interest some centuries later, during the Protestant Reformation. John Calvin, in particular, used these ideas to advocate for image-less worship in Reformed Christianity. Those developments, in turn, led to the attitude we examine in our next session, during which we investigate the decline of beauty in the modern period. I look forward to seeing you then.